folks well we tell them if you don't pass we're going to put you in jail we're going to put a gun to your head and take away your house and take away your car and put you in jail what does this mean as scientists it means that it's incumbent upon us to ask ourselves the following question is my scientific research so intrinsically compelling that if i ask the average person on the street would you fund my science research instead of your kids college education the mortgage on your house your health insurance your trip to hawaii or would you feel comfortable putting a gun to someone's head and putting them in jail if they don't want to fund your study? Now granted, these are, are purposeful, extreme portrayals, but there's some significant truth in both portrayals. And if we don't understand that, we don't understand the playing field. That's one concept. Secondly, how does it play out? How does all this play out in the, in the presidential debate? Science will have virtually no significant impact as a, as a topic within the presidential debate, except in sick, ironic ways, in that on the hard right, the denial of science and the denial of scientific evidence, as in the case of climate change and ocean acidification, will actually garner support from the hard right and will weaken democratic uh, support because they will try to imply that these are economic catastrophes. And they needn't be by any means, Meaning, meaning dealing with the problems are economic. The, the problems themselves are going to be economic catastrophes, no doubt about it. These people will try to say that if you deal with it responsibly, that will harm the, in the, in the economy, and therefore you can't deal with it responsibly. Mitt Romney is smart enough to know better, but he has pandered in a pathetic and demeaning manner, in my judgment, and uh, there is an enormous difference. I'm a Democrat, unapologetically on this issue. There's an enormous difference between the scientific policies of the Democrats and the Republicans. Last factoid. Check out the AAAS, American Association for Advancement of Science website. There's a whole host of information. This is an analysis of the budget differences between the president's budget and the House budget, Paul Ryan's budget. Now, uh, understand the budgets are somewhat symbolic acts, but they then ultimately translate down into the actual appropriations levels. But here's the short-term difference, and I just want to give you some numbers that are pretty astonishing. The short-term difference between the Ryan budget and Obama budget, i.e. fiscal year 2013, which is the year coming up. Uh, the House budget would reduce R&D in eight budget functions by 4.3 billion or 3% below the President's request. This would amount to almost 3% reduction from fiscal year 2012 funding levels. Now, to some extent, give the devil his due, we got to cut funding, uh, but where do you cut it is one of the questions. And understand that $4.3 billion at a time when already the hit ratio if you're applying for federal research funds is also is already discouragingly low, and this is on top of, of cuts to federal, uh, cuts to other, uh, other academic cuts, student loan challenges, et cetera. But it's $4.3 billion for, for FY 2013. If you run these things out uh, uh, over the next, uh, I think it's 10 years, the numbers are pretty astonishing. The president's long-term budget versus the Ryan budget, uh, I'll just quote this, uh, total non-defense R&D funding would end up 27% less than it would under the president's request over a decade. If veterans-related funding were also subjected to the cuts, blah, 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 uh, in dollars, the House budget, which is the Ryan budget, the Republican budget, coupled with alternative sequestration, would reduce total R&D funding by $139 billion through FY 2021 and $161 billion in the non-defense categories. It would cumulatively yield $57 billion less in R&D funding for general space, science, and technology, $19 billion less for energy, $8 billion less for natural resources, $4 billion less for agriculture, and $67 billion less, $67 billion less for healthcare, health R&D. And within the energy field, the, the, the proportion, the cuts would come predominantly in renewable energies, even as they plus up energy for petroleum and, and carbon-based fuels. If anybody tells you there's no difference between the political parties, beg to differ. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Sean. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to echo all of that, but I'm also going to put it into somewhat of a, uh, a slightly different context. Um, the way I start uh, my book, I think, uh, is an important way to begin to think about all of this. Whenever the people are well informed, Thomas Jefferson wrote, they can be trusted with their own government. 
and that was a kind of a central guiding principle in his thinking and the thinking of many of the founding fathers. Um, the question is now though, that, that, that was a time when, I mean if you've ever been to the Library of Congress, you can see Jefferson's Library recreated there, this beautiful round, uh, octagonal or roundish kind of structure there. It contained virtually all the knowledge that existed in the world at that time. He had at his fingertips the World Wide Web right there. <laughs> and he was able to contain that, uh, virtually all of it, in his mind. He was a very, very well-read man, a scientist. Uh, but now, 200 years later, we are living in a very, very different time. Uh, there is no one person, it's just not possible to know all that can be known like that. Uh, science has exploded around the world. Uh, it is no longer a uh, American-dominated field. And those scientists are intertied through the internet and collaborating in ways that they've never collaborated before. We are poised, some people suggest, to make as much new knowledge in the next 40 years as we've made in the last 400 years because of that. So think about uh, that and then think about this thought. Uh, science is never partisan, uh, and I'll explain why I say that, but it is always political. And the reason that science is never partisan is that it is both conservative and progressive on the left-right political spectrum. No scientist is going to stick his or her neck out there unless they researched the literature, made sure that something that they, some claim they might make or some, uh, something that they're thinking about publishing on uh, is well supported and that there's nothing out there that is going to contradict it or embarrass them. Uh, that's a quick way to uh, uh, reduce your prospects of receiving future grant money. Um, but they are also progressive inherently, uh, tolerant, open to new ideas, willing to go where the evidence leads. Uh, because that creativity is really how you move forward. Okay, so science is both progressive and conservative, uh, and essentially neither, but it is always political. Uh, why is it always political? Because science takes nothing on faith. And this is where science ties in with the founding ideas of uh, the United States. It is essentially anti-authoritarian, just as democracy is. It says, show me the evidence and I will judge for myself. So no king or no pope can claim to have a greater uh, access to the truth or a greater authority if each individual can decide for themselves based on the evidence. Well, if that's the case, then we have a justification for a form of government called democracy of by and for the people because each person has equal access or opportunity to have access to the truth. So science is always political because uh, as we create new knowledge, uh, we inherently disrupt vested interests based on old ideas, whether those uh, vested interests are uh, based on old ideas in the Bible uh, or if they're based on old ideas from the technology or scientific advances of 50 or 100 years ago. So when Galileo made a simple observation that the uh, evidence seemed to suggest that the Earth run, uh, goes around the sun, that was a strong challenge to the vested interests that were uh, the political authority at the time, which is the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, today, climate scientists make simple observations based on measurements that suggest that uh, human behavior is in fact warming the planet, uh, and therefore we should look to changing human behavior as a solution uh, to that problem, uh, which puts it right into the policy realm. And that is a challenge to the, probably the most powerful vested interest in the planet today, which is the U.S. energy industry. Uh, Exxon is uh, the most valuable company in the world. Uh, Coke Industries is the second uh, most valuable privately held uh, company in America uh, after Cargill. Uh, so you can see that there's a tremendous amount of power there. There's a trillion dollars worth of carbon uh, still sitting in the ground. Uh, and it's worth spending uh, a billion bucks a year to try and uh, uh, hold off uh, regulatory uh, solutions that might change that. So science is uh, inter intersecting in the policy realm always on this idea when it challenges vested interests, be they ideological or economic. Uh, and we're seeing that play out right now in a variety of areas in our, uh, in our policy discussions in Washington. And it's getting to the point where um, science is beginning to pose some serious challenges to democracy as a form of government. And this gets into the comment that, that she opened up with. 
the the reason that i say that science now influences every aspect of life is not it doesn't influence every aspect of our policy discussion and that's the problem but it does influence every aspect of life and in fact the majority of our unsolved policy challenges that democracy has been unable to tackle over the next 40 years or the last 40 years really revolve around this intersection of science with with democracy and generally they're about questions about individual rights versus individual responsibilities or the role of the individual versus the collective that Ayn Rand kind of discussion that we're having in our politics right now and all of this began to emerge with the evolution of environmental science really regulatory science as soon as science began to move into complex systems science where we said wait a minute we can't just move a new discovery about hydrocarbons and immediately capitalize it on it on it in industry there are probably environmental consequences as soon as that happened industry found itself in a more mixed relationship with science supporting science when it was convenient opposing it when it wasn't the same thing with more conservative religion when we gained began to gain control over the reproductive cycle so you see questions about birth control contraception abortion definitions of when pregnancy begins or doesn't begin stem cell research all of these things in biology around the reproductive cycle so that's where our arguments tend to happen regulation and reproduction those two R's so as to Brian's comment about science not being in play this election cycle I there may be some movement recently because of the heavy investment of the Koch brothers through Americans for Prosperity they're running a major ad buy right now that's attacking Obama they put in about 60 million dollars of their own personal funds into a super PAC to do this they're attacking him on economic issues but really it's about oil and last week in Rolling Stone Obama said that he was going to stake out climate change as more of an issue and he sees that that's probably going to become more active in his campaign over the next couple of months and I think that he's probably doing that for two reasons one is he can battle back some of the messaging from Americans for Prosperity by saying this is really about climate it's not about these other issues that their ad is about but two he has an opportunity maybe to box Mitt Romney into his message box in a way that's going to be hard for him to escape because Romney has vacillated his position on climate quite noticeably in order to secure the nomination he's had to change his position quite markedly so if he he's kind of caught if he goes back on on his newly adopted skepticism about climate change he risks losing his base and demoralizing or taking some of the fire out of his base on the other hand if if he doesn't do that he risks losing centrist voters because polling shows that that 68 percent of Americans do now accept that climate change is happening and it's and it's human cost 